mangrove forests. They are probably the weirdest ecosystem that you may never have even heard of. They're really unique because they're the only forest that, for part of the day, is dry land. And then just a couple of hours later, they're part of the sea. And this is a really stressful environment for any forest to try and survive in. But somehow, over the last 80 million years or so, mangrove forests have figured out how to do it. And as well as being unique, they are critical for biodiversity. They are home to countless species of insects, crabs, fish, otters, crocodiles, and more. Even the home of the endangered royal Bengal tiger, whose last refuge is the mangrove forest of the Sundarbans on the border between India and Bangladesh, one of the largest remaining mangrove forests on the planet. But it's not just biodiversity. They are also critical for people and the coastal communities that rely on them. They're a really important source of fish and shellfish, of medicinal products, of construction materials and fuel wood. They help buffer our coastlines against storms, and they help trap our pollutants in their soil. And the ecotourism industry around mangroves is worth billions of dollars every year across the tropics. So despite all of those benefits I just described, what if I told you that this seedling here was the last mangrove seedling on the planet? That mangroves were no longer able to buffer our coastlines against storms, to trap our pollutants? This would be a real problem, because as well as all of those benefits, Mangroves are on the front line in protecting us against climate change. This graph here shows different ecosystems and how much carbon per hectare they're able to store. Like all plants, mangroves and rainforests and other ecosystems absorb carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, and they lock it up in their leaves and their branches and their roots. And this is the green part of the graph. And mangroves and rainforests and other ecosystems are all able to do this. But what's different about mangrove forests is that they are able to store a lot of that carbon in their soils, which means that they can, per unit area, store almost twice as much carbon as other ecosystems. And this is what mangrove soil looks like. So if we're in a rainforest, when those leaves and branches fall off the tree and onto the surface of the forest floor, they quickly get broken down by bacteria and fungi. And all of that carbon that was locked up in those leaves is put back into the atmosphere. Now, that doesn't happen with mangrove forests because their soils are waterlogged. And so instead, when those leaves fall onto the surface, they accumulate over thousands of years, and we have this superstore of carbon. Despite all of those benefits, we were almost close to having what was a group of world-renowned scientists in 2007 described as a world without mangroves, where this scene would be commonplace across the tropics. And this is because we thought we were losing mangrove forests at 1 to 3 percent per year. Some international organizations said it was almost as much as 8% per year. And this put mangroves on par with the Amazon rainforest and the coral reefs of the world in being some of the world's most threatened habitats. And this was mostly due to conversion for economic gain. So this is a satellite image. It's a bit blurry. It's from 1985. Uh, but it's a typical scene of a coastline in Indonesia. And you can see a top-down view of the mangrove forests. Now, if we fast forward to the present day, this is what that scene looks like. That mangrove forest has been replaced with all of these squares which represent aquaculture ponds for the production of shrimp and fish. And actually, this kind of patchwork quilt 
of, of aquaculture has been replicated along many of our coastlines across the tropics. But it wasn't just aquaculture. We've lost mangroves in Southeast Asia due to conversion to rice paddies, in West Africa due to oil pollution, in East Africa due to overharvesting, and in the Caribbean, mangroves are often converted into urban areas and tourist resorts. But despite all of those pressures and threats, somehow we turned the tide on mangrove loss. Rates of mangrove loss in the 21st century were only a fifth of the rates of loss in the 20th century. This is a great conservation success story. It's something we should celebrate, but it's actually a story that is not even that well known within conservation circles. So how did we save the mangroves? Well, first of all, we got a lot better at mapping and monitoring them so we know where they are and we know how much is being lost. But it was also because we got a much stronger understanding of all of those benefits that I described. Unfortunately, it took terrible disasters, such as the Indian Ocean tsunami or Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines, for governments to recognize the importance of their own mangrove forests. It took climate change negotiations, such as the Paris Agreement, to show governments that it's better to keep that carbon locked up in the mangrove soil rather than emitting it into the atmosphere. And as a result, we've seen huge conservation changes along mangrove forests. So in 2015, Sri Lanka announced that it would not destroy any more mangroves and it would protect all of its remaining mangroves. The government of Belize has strengthened all of its mangrove regulations. And even here in Singapore, in the last two years, we have rapidly expanded the number of mangrove forests that are under protection. However, despite all of these great successes, the job isn't done. And these hard-earned gains are not guaranteed into the future. Because we know there are a lot of threats on the horizon. Mangroves still continue to be lost around the world. And countries such as Myanmar are losing mangroves at rates many times the global average. And we're seeing new deforestation frontiers open up around Southeast Asia and West Africa. And of course, our mangroves are dealing with the same pollution issues that the rest of our coasts and oceans are dealing with. The great ocean plastic crisis around the world is also the great mangrove plastic crisis. And we're always thinking in the future about the issues of climate change. Now, mangroves being along our coastlines, they're really in the front line against sea level rise. Mangroves can just about tolerate some flooding uh, by the coast, but of course, with sea level rise, we expect that flooding to increase. And what we're worried about is if it increases beyond the tolerance of what mangrove species can survive. So will mangroves be able to keep pace with sea level rise, or are they going to drown in the future? But I'm talking a lot about the future, but actually climate change is happening right now. This devastating image is taken from a helicopter over the Northern Territory in Australia. It is just a snapshot of a 1,000 kilometer stretch of mangroves that died suddenly in 2015. And it was due to a number of climatic factors. There was an extended drought, very high temperatures, and actually a temporary drop in sea level due to climatic oscillations. And what happened is basically the mangrove dried out and died. Now we expect droughts and air temperatures and climatic oscillations to increase with uncertainty in the future under climate change. But climate change isn't a fuzzy concept which will happen at the end of the century. We have evidence that is happening now. So undoubtedly, there are huge challenges remaining in the conservation of mangrove forests. Yet I think it is crucial that we remain optimistic. Now we hear a lot about doom and gloom in the global biodiversity crisis. And we're used to seeing images that shock us. Now just close your eyes for a moment 
and think about what the global biodiversity crisis means to you. What images does it bring up in your mind? You might be imagining coral bleaching of the Great Barrier Reef, or deforestation of the Amazon, or the last polar bear on an ever-shrinking piece of ice. Now, we see these images day in, day out, and they do shock. But after a while, they kind of lose their shock, and amidst this uh, doom and gloom, you know, it's easy just to throw our hands up and say, what's the point? Whatever we do doesn't work. We're not changing the world. Let's just give up. When I think of biodiversity and the global biodiversity crisis, I actually try to think of a more inspiring and optimistic uh, picture. And it's this picture here called the Blue Marble, taken in 1972 by the Apollo 17 space mission. It is one of the most reproduced images in the world. And it helped galvanize the global environmental movement in the 1970s. And it did so in part because it showed quite how fragile the planet is. But when I see the blue marble, I actually think of some other aspects of this photo, and particularly how much it inspires me. And it shows that there is something beautiful still left, which is still worth fighting for. So, how can we use mangroves to inspire people in the same way that the Blue Marble inspired me? Well, I think we have a unique opportunity to come together and understand how we turned the tide on mangrove loss. How did we get mangrove deforestation rates so low? And can we use that momentum to drive that all the way to zero? And can we come together and learn lessons from mangrove forests and apply them to other ecosystems where they're still kind of lagging under this conservation uh, trajectory. Amidst the global biodiversity crisis, I hope that mangrove forests provide a, a bright spot, a light at the end of the tunnel, and just maybe a cause for optimism. <laughs>